I am Irma Gottlieb. My maiden name is Glass. I was born in Germany in a very, very little place. In fact, it was a village. What town they had in 900 inhabitants and one Jewish family. And we were the Jewish family. The name is Zuko Andeina, which is in Pomeran. Pomerania, I guess it's called. And I had a beautiful childhood. I'm an only child. Not only was I spoiled, but at the same time, I knew how far I could go. My father would look at me. That meant be quiet or behave or whatever. And I was just like everybody else in a little village. When I was 10 years old, I went to school, a Oberlyceum, which is like a middle school here, going the preparation for college. I would stay in a pension, and over the weekend I would go home. Our chauffeur would pick me up, or my dad would pick me up, and I left Saturday afternoon right after school and returned on Sunday evening. Everything was fine. I had piano lessons. I played with everyone. And I was just another kid in a high school. And then came 1933, and things started to change. They didn't want to play with a Jewish girl. They didn't want to have anything to do with me. And I guess I was, till my, about 16 years, so that means three years I could take it, and then I guess it was too much. And my parents sent me to a so-called finishing school in Berlin, and it's called Lenitz, which is a few, I guess, half an hour's drive is a train from Berlin. And the place was known as, or our neighbor was a concentration camp, Oranienburg, Sachsenhausen. There I had a wonderful time. I was with Jewish people, with Jewish kids, or young kids, and uh, everything was fine till Kristallnacht, Kristallnacht, in 1938. And I had a friend, which still is around, she lives in Australia, and on third in November, I think it was the ninth of the November, we were warned, I worked in the office already, and we were warned that people would come and do us harm. But they didn't say it like they would do us harm. They told us, they warned us, leave. And that's when my girlfriend and I left, and we were one hour in Sachsenhausen. And the policeman who saw us there said, they are okay, let them go. And that's the way we, <laughs> we... We were left alone, and we took the train to Berlin, and where my parents were. The story about my parents is a long one, and uh, I loved them dearly. The place where I was born is the place where my mother was born. To what town and by was grand, it's a small place, Zuko and the Ina. It's oh. a little village, and the next big town was Stargard, Stettin, which is now known as Setchen. And now it's Polish. Okay. So a few years ago, I went back to Germany. 
I felt I owe it to my parents. And I met the people that came from the same little village, and they told me all the stories about the Poles. The Poles took over, and um, they wanted me to drive me back to our little village, which I refused. My memories of my house or my everything was beautiful, and they took pictures, and what's left of the house is only part. So why should I go there and cry? But That's part of Germany. <laughs> yeah. And then after Kristallnacht, I'm going back to that time. I was 18 and a half, and um, oh, for my 18th birthday, my father gave me the money to learn how to drive a car, which I did for half a year, not quite half a year in Berlin. And then we, we my parents were able to buy themselves out, and we bought a ticket to Shanghai. So I left with my parents February 22nd, 1939, we went to China. Wow. It's the right time to leave. It was very smart of my dad, and uh, he got us out. My uncle came with us, and the five of us, the old, the well, he was older than my dad, so the middle brother, I guess. I had one uncle already in Israel. So we went to China. Which <laughs> uncle went with you? Uncle Rhodes, who was a cousin. That, again, is a different story. He had his own story. But we were all in Shanghai, and later on I had one more cousin and wife following us, and life was tough. That was 1939. I, yeah, yeah, February. It was one month being on a ship. It was a luxury liner, the smallest luxury liner that the Italian had was called the shipping line was Lloyd Tri Lloyd Triestino. Lloyd Triestino and our ship was the Victoria. And that was the first time I was free, just like a teenager. I could dance, I could participate in everything and being first class the dinner of course was suburb. And there was wine with every meal. So in luxury, we arrived in Shanghai. And from the ship being picked up, put on a, on a truck, and we were brought into a camp. Did you know anyone in Shanghai? No. Mm -mm. It was a little rough. <laughs> it was a little rough. Um, the camp was, the men were separated from the women. My mother and I, we were in one room. I don't know how many Women were in one room, and my dad was in the men's section. I don't know what else to actually tell you. What was the very you, but first thing you remember about coming to Shanghai? Either a smell or a sight or a impression or a sound. What's the very first thing you remember? I guess being free. I don't know what to expect. 
And, but going to Shanghai was lovely. The going through the Suez Canal, stopping in Eden, being in Bombay, and uh, Singapore, Manila, Hong Kong, mm-hmm. Shanghai. It was quite something, and being the first time without fear, that was the main thing. Yeah. Must have been a good feeling. It felt safer. It felt safe. Yeah. The life in the camp was quite hard. Um, first of all, we didn't know what's going to happen. What are we going to do? We don't speak Chinese, we don't speak Japanese, we... nothing. So, but slowly, uh, we started to learn things, and the... all together we were 20,000 refugees. So we had our own... Things we had our own hospital, we had our own medical stuff, because a lot of our young doctors or middle-aged doctors were there, and uh, they did the best they could to help us. And we started to find jobs. People started to open up their own stores. We had a bakery. We had a butcher just like any other place. And so it was, I guess, a good life. So being in a camp was not so bad. It's not the camp. People were in the camp, but people got out of the camp the minute they could do something on their own. Like, my parents were also very lucky. They had all our belongings shipped to Shanghai. They arrived in a, they call it container. So we had everything that you possibly could think of, and everything was sold. One day, day my mother said, we sell the chair, and we have food with that. Another day was some dishes, and... uh, that's the way they li- li- lived. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. The story is too long. <laughs> and I don't think anyone would really be So you were in the interested. camp how long? How many? Just a few months. And uh, then we rented one room. The three of us in one room. And in the house... We had a kitchen to share a kitchen. <laughs> it was a spot. We shared one bathroom, we shared the kitchen, and uh, you smelled everything. And it was hard to just live like that. But that's what this we was all still did. still in Shanghai. Mm-hmm. And there were a lot, uh, quite a few who were very lucky. They didn't have to live in a camp. They lived in French town. That was, Shanghai was an international city, as you know. Yeah. The international settlement, you had the British section, you had the French section, you had an American section, everything. And the Jews were living in Hongqiu which was actually run by the Japanese. That was right after 1936, the Japanese took over this part of Shanghai. And everything was... As I said, we had our own little village. How long were you in the uh, that apartment? Apartment? Don't call it apartment. <laughs> there was one room. <laughs> One room in a building? <laughs> in, I don't know how many, uh, there must have been five or six uh, families. And then uh, the parents, as I said before, sold things, 
and we had our so-called own house. And we rented rooms to other people. So my parents had already two rooms, a bedroom and a living room, <laughs> which had all the rest of the furniture. And um, I slept on a couch in the living room. I, uh, I met my husband, and, well, actually... What year would that have been? Also in, oh, that was in 39. 39. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. So shortly after you arrived... Right, you right, met I husband. met my husband. Was that love so at first sight? So we dated, <laughs> eh, more or less. <laughs> I still had other friends, a lot of, a lot, quite a few of my old friends came from Berlin, and, um... Where did your husband come from? My husband comes from Austria. He had a completely different story than I had, and, um, to make it short, we... We were engaged in 40, and my parents wouldn't ask, let me get married, because he went into the interior of China, which was, nobody knew what and where and what to expect. So my parents didn't permit me to get married. And I said, all right, we can wait till I'm 21 and I was waiting and they said if he comes back and you still feel as you feel as you do today strongly about being in love then we get married which we did I waited he came back and we were married in 41 it was in Shanghai that was in Shanghai we were married at the German consulate I have the papers with the Nazi symbol, the Hakenkreuz, and then uh, afterwards the swastika. And afterwards we were married by my uncle in the, just like a regular Jewish wedding. Uh, it was not a synagogue. During the day, it served in a camp. During the day, it served as a dining hall, and otherwise, in the afternoon or whatnot, they had uh, performances, people, and in this case, they performed weddings. So, I was married there. And what? Then, I was married there in June the 15th, 1941. <laughs> An important day. <laughs> yeah. We are going to be married 67 years. Wow. And children? I have two children. One was born in... But that was later. One was born in China? After the war, yes. One was born in China. It just came off. Doesn't stay on. Okay. One was born in China. Yeah, but this was after the war. First comes, we were married in 41, in June, and I went with my husband into the interior of China. And... And neither one of you could speak Chinese. My husband had spoke Chinese by then. I learned a little bit. And um, that was a hard part. We went through no man's land. No man's land being the part between free China and the Japanese occupied. We made it. 
And once we crossed into free China, we had all the protections you could want. We had Chinese guards to go with us because my husband worked for the Chinese government, which is called the Salt Administration. And we traveled quite a bit. And before we came to our destination, we, they had a Japanese air raid, and the Japanese planes came. And that was my first knowing about war. We lost everything in the bombing. And I guess I was very lucky that the Chinese girl next to me lost a leg. And I came out without a scratch, except being full of mud. And I was so mad at my husband because he pushed me down in the mud. And I guess that saved my life. Anyhow, we came back and we had absolutely nothing, just the things that we wore. And I guess the first time I cried because it was cold and I covered myself as a Chinese newspaper. And then we came to the place where he started to work. There were a lot of places. There was Quailin, there was uh, Quay Young and Kumming. And in Kumming we lived till well, we lived quite a while in Kumming. But in Kumming we met other uh, in the olden days we would say white people. Uh, European or American people and it didn't make a difference if you were a Jew or if you were a Catholic or whatever and you were so to speak s keeping together and and being together and being they all helped each other my best friends were the Catholic nuns and the Catholic priests sold us some bread. They had they baked the bread. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had any. I tried once my own, but it didn't work good. So, uh, <clears throat> you did not experience much anti-Semitism. Of course not. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> no, not at all. And then came Pearl Harbor which was another thing. And before Pearl Harbor, we had the Flying Tigers, which you probably all had heard about. They helped the Chinese, and the minute they were there, our air raids were fewer. That means the Japanese bombed us not as often. What yeah. else should I say? Let's see. Uh, this was during the war. And now comes the war. Pearl Harbor. Yes. And before that, we stayed or we shared one house with Eric's boss. And uh, he was British, she was an American. They had two children. And we said... Uh, we were good with them. The children liked us, and I played with them. Um, and this couple, Mr. and Mrs. Dubs, wanted to go to Hong Kong to buy Christmas things. And I had given them a big list, because in those days, after I had lost everything, I only wore Chinese things. And I could wear them very well because I was slim. 
<laughs> and uh, they had the list, and they left for Hong Kong about, I think, two days before Pearl Harbor. And I took care of the children. We didn't know anything about what had happened that the war broke out and Mr. Dobbs was caught with his wife in Hong Kong. He was killed. Was by the bombings? No, he defending Hong Kong. He was a okay. British and uh, the wife was taken in a camp being an American, and we were stuck in Kuming, taking care of the children, which was fine. There was no problem till, I think, April. And the British consul came and he said, you are a German. You cannot take care of British children. They took the children from us, which were crying. I never forget. And they were taken over by some missionaries, and that's the rest of of that story. And then, how long did you take care of the children? This was well, uh, from during the war, de December till April. Okay. From Pearl Harbor till yep. April. And then came the Americans, and they needed technical advisors. They needed technical people. And they approached my husband and asked if he wanted to join the army or being in as technical advisor working with the army, but with the Chinese. And that's the rest of it. <laughs> there are so many things. We traveled to many places. I met a lot of people, wonderful people. Uh, at the beginning, I'm going back again, it's before okay. Pearl Harbor. Um, there were a lot of young men who had left Europe and they had fought in Spain, the Freedom War, and uh, they had no place to go but China. Most of them were medical people, doctors, mm -hmm. and so on. And they also took care at the beginning of myself and, and Eric. I learned a lot and um, what to eat and what not to eat, how to take care. They were our friends. What else shall I say? There are so many things. And so how long were you in uh, China? All during the war. And when did you leave? Well, first of all, we were there till 1945, till when the war ended. In the meantime, I had heard from my parents who were in Shanghai three times through the American Red Cross. They didn't know what Eric was doing, where we were, and what we were doing and um, when we came back to Shanghai we didn't know where they were we had to find them Your we parents? didn't know yes we didn't know that the Germans had put them all into a ghetto they put them where? in a ghetto oh in the ghetto okay so we went and we asked for various people 
Have you seen Hermann Glass? Have you seen Rhodes Glass, who was a cantor and known by the or known? And we found them. And when we walked in, Erich, hör auf I mit dem Auto. So. What's wrong with it? Good eyes, good eyes. Good eyes to clean up okay. the carpet. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Thanks, yes, Eric. it's embarrassing. So when okay. we came and met our parents again, they couldn't believe how come Eric is an American soldier in uniform. So we had to explain all that. We stayed one more year, we stayed three more years in Shanghai. In the meantime, my daughter was born there in a camp, in a hospital also run by our refugee doctors. And, and Eric was in the uh, American Army. Eric was still as a civilian oh, in the time. American army okay. all along. Then so we came to America, to what, Chicago. What year was that? 48. 48. Our daughter was born in 47. She was a year old. Our other that's daughter... Evelyn. That's Evelyn. That's Evelyn, yeah. And our second daughter was born in Chicago. Her name is Bernice. Okay. Evelyn can be a senator. My younger daughter could be a president. So <laughs> that's what we always told the children. That's not. <laughs> <laughs> that was encouraging. That's good. Okay. We so were happy. What? We were happy. Eric worked for GM. GM in Chicago? In LaGrange. LaGrange, okay. Diesel. And uh, our children grew up, went to school in Oak Park High, went to college, got married. We retired to Florida, we're happy, in Longboat Key. Then we came here to Scottsdale. When did you and live Scott's ever happily. When did you arrive in Scottsdale? Um, 13, uh, 10 years ago. Oh. 10 or 11 years ago. We lived in Casa del Monte, and now we are in a retirement section, Sierra Point. Oh, good. And we hope to be there for a long time. Sounds good. In the meantime, we had our golden wedding, celebrating that in Florida, our six years we celebrated here, and maybe we have another few That's years. That's wonderful. Wonderful. That's Dada. Okay. <laughs> there are so many little yeah. stories in between that would only bore you. No, they wouldn't. That's the stories that we want to hear because no one else knows them. Well. Evelyn, I hear you saying, but I can't hear you. Tell Bob what I said, Evelyn said they have so many little stories, that's the one we want to hear. And I said, no, that takes too long. <laughs> they have no interest there, Jess. They are of interest because nobody else knows them. Well, I, I don't know, those little stories might be very exciting. But you did not experience a, a lot of anti-Semitism during your stay in China or before you went in to China? In China, not at all. Or before you went to China? Yes. Because wherever we went and whatever we did, no Jews allowed. So I did not have a wonderful uh, use. But growing up, when you were very young, like in a Germany, teenager, I was not a teenager like a teenager here, happy, because I never could go any place. I was limited. 